Good afternoon, everyone. This is Karen. I am the host of this webinar, and my name is Karen Mann. Today, I'm missing my co-chair. Usually, Sudita Hasi is, uh, joins with me, but today I'll be doing uh, the cover from start to end. We represent the Human Development and Leadership Division of the American Society for Quality. This is a global division aiming to enrich the personal and professional lives of our members and non-members across the global community. We continuously look for new speakers within the range of our body of knowledge, which can be found in my ASQ HDNL community site. We host monthly webinars, so if you are interested to know or you know of someone that could be interested, we would be happy to review their application. Before we begin the webinar for today, let me go over some webinar rules. If there is any question or comment, please type it in the question tab. The webinar will be held for 45 minutes, and right after that, we will have Q&A session for 15 minutes. And those of you that attend for 15 minutes, uh, you will receive 0.1 CEU through an email, which you can then save and use it to claim your credits for ASQ. We are today very delighted to introduce to you our guest, Stan Renteria, tonight. And he will be speaking on the topic that I'm actually very excited. I was asking him how many times he is speaking on this topic. Failures are stepping stones to success. Stan is currently a senior quality systems manager at Medtronic's Powered Surgical Solutions in Fort, in Fort Worth, Texas, a division of Medtronic's PLS, a medical technology company with its corporate headquarters located in Dublin. Ireland and operational headquarters in Manistore. Stan's career has been focused on manufacturing and quality, having worked in automotive, aerospace, telecommunication, and medical device industries. Stan is responsible for multi-site quality system change control teams with which executives executes product and QMS document changes for Medtronic's business located in six U.S. states. For more than two decades, Stan has actively cultivated his interest in leadership and self-improvement and takes the opportunity to sharpen and practice those soft skills daily in his effort to add value to people around him. Stan also holds a CSSGB and a CQIA certification. Stan, very impressive profile, and I'm looking forward to this topic, which seems to go mean it's going to be a very interesting topic, and an hour is going to fly through. So, Stan, the floor is all yours. Look forward to hear from you now. Thank you very much, Karen. I would like first to thank each person who has taken the time out of their day or their evening to attend this webinar. These are the, the webinar objectives I'm going to be covering today. Um, as we were growing up, or in all the years we attended school, few of us were trained to deal with failure. In fact, many of us were taught to do whatever it takes to avoid failing. Learning to play, play an instrument, playing sports, or just looking kind of cool in the eyes of our peers, choosing a spouse, no one wishes to fail. And if we do fail, we've been conditioned to feel discouraged or even disgraced, not energized. Can you relate to that? What we didn't hear about the most notable successes in history is what the people who achieved them did to win. In this presentation, we'll discuss the true character of failure, seven key reasons that people fail, and we'll hear some inspiring examples of how some of history's most successful people achieved their breakthroughs and how we too can consider failure our friend. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge my information sources. Since 1997, I've followed the writings and teachings of John C. Maxwell, perhaps one of the greatest leadership teachers of our current day. His experience as a pastor, leading one of the largest churches in America, and then transitioning to starting his current leadership business, which is, has equipped and inspired millions of leaders all around the globe, has made a significant impact on the lives of leaders everywhere. Today's talk is largely based on the principles published in John's book, 
Failing Forward, first published in the early 2000s and updated shortly after 2010. Other of John's books I've pulled into this talk include The Maxwell Leadership Bible, Today Matters, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, and Talent is Never Enough. I've been a student of John's and other notable high profile leaders over the years. My talk today simply brings some of their key points into this summarized session. I've acknowledged my sources later on in this deck. One more thing to mention before we begin. My passion is in continually learning and refreshing leadership education and in bringing key learnings to others with the hope that someone will embrace one or more things that will create a positive impact on their leadership and life. And that's why I'm here today. During this session, we'll start, we, there will be four polls presented in which you are asked for your responses related to the topic being presented. Let's start with poll number one. So the question is, have you ever received any training on how to handle failure? Please answer yes or no. So everyone, uh, the poll is right on your screen. I'll wait for 30 seconds to see what the answers are. Awesome. I think Stan, you probably are going to expect this as a result. That's what I thought to see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's always yep. so interesting to see the results coming out of. Yeah, yeah. Bingo. So, okay, I'm going to give 10 more seconds, guys. So, if you, few of you, if you're still uh, thinking about which choice to make, and then I'm closing it off. Okay, so the results are 26% said yes and 74% said no. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it would have been 74 point whatever if I would have participated because I have definitely never been taught to fail. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are we good to proceed? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's talk about the character of failure. So let's begin with a fact about people. There are two basic types, average people and achieving people. The average people are those who live day to day, accomplishing things needed to live and to make things happen for themselves and for others around them, their families, friends, coworkers. They participate in events and can even excel in some things. They typically stay within pre-established social and professional boundaries. They play it safe, and if they do step out, it's not far beyond the general population. Achieving people are those who dream and who drive themselves to take uncommon action in their attempt to make extraordinary progress, even when it becomes painful. The key difference between the two types of people is their perspective of failure. Character and values. They are important factors, but the fundamental difference is about how they perceive failure. Both types can be either good or bad people. If we think about noteworthy achievers, we can likely think of some, some that you feel good about and others that you don't believe are very good people. Failure is not a direct opposite of success. Failure is an important part of the process involved in creating success. The success cycle involves trying something, testing it, possibly failing, learning from it, making course corrections, and repeating the process in cycles until you've got it. Failure is, a, is an investment. It's a price that must be paid. You're buying progress. Everything comes at a price. Here's a short story illustrating that failures can be necessary in the path to success. On August 6, 1999, a Major League Baseball player stepped up to home plate in Montreal and made yet another out, the 5,113th of his professional career. That's a lot of trips to the batter's box without a hit. If a player made all of those outs consecutively, 
and he averaged four at-bats per game, he would play eight seasons. That's 1,278 games straight without ever reaching first base. Was the player discouraged that night? Nope. Did he think he had failed himself or his team? Nope. You see, earlier in the game, in his first batter-up experience, he reached a milestone that only 21 other people in the history of baseball ever achieved. He had made his 3,000th hit. That player was Tony Gwynn of the San Diego Padres. During that game, Tony got on base with hits four times in five tries, but that's not the norm for him. Usually he fails to get a hit two times out of every three attempts. Those results may not sound very encouraging, but if you know baseball, you recognize that Tony's ability to succeed consistently only one time in three tries has made him the greatest hitter of his generation. And Tony recognizes that to get hits, he must make a lot of outs. Bad failure happens when you fail to learn from mistakes and mishaps. You don't look for improvements. You may stop right there, or you simply try again, fail again, still don't learn, fail again, repeating the cycle, and then you're done. Albert Einstein said, and we've all heard this quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Good failure happens when you, when you use learning cycles trial, failure, learning, trying again, learning, repeating the cycle over and over until you achieve the success you were seeking. This can be applied to every area of life. People are not educated on the topic of failure. There's little to no guidance provided that directs one step in expecting failure and then on how to leverage it. Joe Fraser, former world heavyweight boxing champion said, Champions are not made in the ring, they're merely recognized there. Nobody just shows up to a significant event without having gone through carefully planned preparation. Having the ability to compete in a heavyweight boxing championship match is evident that there had been extensive preparation. Here are seven things that failure is not. Failure is not avoidable. We are flawed creatures. No one fully avoids mistakes. Some of us err frequently. Failure is not an event. It does not come as, as the result of a moment. It comes as the result of a process. Failure is not objective. It is not absolute. It's a subjective judgment regarding what worked and what didn't and what it really means. Failure is not the enemy. It is our friend. Failures are tools used to help define improvement and potentially as measures that tell us when we're getting closer to success. People who see failure only as the enemy are taken captive by its negative outcomes. Number five, failure is not irreversible. Almost always after a failure, it's possible, it's possible to start over. And a very true statement I found, don't know who wrote it, but I heard it. It's okay if the milk gets spilled, as long as you still have your cow. Number six, failure is not a stigma. Getting a failing result does not mark you as a failure. And number seven, failure is not final. It can be if you quit. Most successes come after numerous failure events. Here's a short story about a past by pastor and author David Jeremiah. It's about a great scientist who did not characterize his research trials as a series of failures. Jonas Salk. The great scientist and discoverer of the polio vaccine was asked, how does this outstanding achievement, which has effectively eliminated the word polio from our vocabulary, cause you to view your previous 200 failures? And Mr. Salk replied, I have never had 200 failures in my whole life. My family didn't think in terms of failure. They taught in terms of learning experiences. I simply made my 201st discovery, and I couldn't have made it without having learned from my previous 200 experiences. Now we're gonna talk about seven key reasons that people fail. I'll get to the, each one of these. We don't need to read through them right now. Poor people skills. Social intelligence, 
is a perfect and necessary partner of academic intelligence. Social intelligence is the non-technical aspect of getting things done. Social intelligence involves effective listening. How true is the quote, people don't learn by talking. An effective listener does not spend all his or her time thinking of a response in parallel with the person who's, who's doing the talking. The focus is on the person who's talking, their words, their emphasis, their expression, and their emotions. And this is followed by a thoughtful response. Sometimes a person is not even looking for a solution. They're looking just to be heard and supported. People don't care what you know unless they first know that you really care. And if you don't make a positive impression on others, they just might help you fail. And if you do make a positive impression on others, you build a relationship of trust and they might even overlook small mistakes and maybe even some big ones. Theodore Roosevelt said, the most important single ingredient in the formula of success is knowing how to get along with people. Number two, a bad fit. Anyone who's not matched to their job, a project or some other, other area may experience frequent or chronic failure. The question for you, are you matched to your work life? Are your greatest talents, skills, and giftings being applied in your daily work? If your answer is yes, congratulations, you made it. You're in a very nice position in life. If the answer is no, either you're frustrated to some degree or you apply yourself outside the workplace to, to, to work on the thing that you really enjoy. Maybe you're a musician, a philanthropist, a Sunday school teacher, or whatever, whatever it is that helps fulfill you. Here's a story about a person who became famous after transitioning away from a non-optimal fit. Gabrielle Coco Chanel was born in 1883, orphaned early in life and raised by nuns. She set out to become a singer, but only after a couple of performances, she realized singing was not her greatest talent, and she ended her singing career, taking a job as a hat maker. That led her to begin designing women's fashions. In 1921, at the age of 38, she introduced her first fragrance, Chanel No. 5. Coco Chanel may never have created her beautiful perfume or become an icon in the fashion industry if her singing career had been successful. Failure plays a part in everyone's life. As we learn from our encounters with failure, we can open the door to positive changes in our lives. If you're honest with yourself and with others, can you tell whether you, you are where your best fit is? As you're thinking about your own personal reality, John Maxwell suggests three basic questions to ask yourself. First, what do I dream about? What are the dreams of your heart? What would you do if you had no fear of failure? Are you equipped for it? There may be instances like in Coco Chanel's case where a person dreams to be something they're not gifted at or even capable of doing well. In those, it's in those times a person must be self-aware, realizing what they're good at. It will not help to dream about becoming a world-class concert pianist if you don't have the dexterity needed in your hands and fingers. Or what if you wish to win one of today's talent shows as a vocalist, but you can't seem to stay on pitch? Number two, what do I cry about? What moves you and makes you wish to step out and take action for a cause? Maybe you see the homeless or struggling single mothers or populations of people in countries that just need help and you would like to do something to make life better for them. And number three, what do I sing about? What makes you happy? What brings the flood of joy up from inside you? Is it helping others? Is it about being the one who finds a solution to a big problem? Is it achieving success? If it's that, maybe start making failure your friend. Here's poll number two. Are you in a job that maximizes your talents or giftings? There you go, and we have launched it. Are you in a job that maximizes your talent or gifting? 
Okay. I really feel that today's webinar is going to make many people question. Okay, we got 72% voted. If I can request the rest of the people to take uh, their vote in next 10 seconds, please. Let's have uh, a better accurate numbers in front of us. Appreciate that, thank you. Okay, so I am going to close the poll and there you go. So the results are 50-50. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, we got some people that really, you know, making it happen for themselves, aren't they? Yeah. The got to go make something happen. <laughs> don't tell your boss that I said that, though. Dan said, <laughs> no, please don't. Okay. Are we good to proceed? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Number three, a lack of focus. A lack of focus in anything can lead to poor or even disastrous results. Things can go wrong when you're not paying attention. Customers who are counting on you can become dissatisfied. Here's a story about an unfortunate outcome resulting from a lack of focus. One day, a businessman visited a small town florist. In order to order flowers for a friend who was opening a new business, the floral shop owner was a little bit busy at the time and rushing to fill orders while she took the businessman's information. Later that day, the man arrived at his friend's grand opening and saw a big floral wreath with, wreath with his name on it that said, with deepest sympathy during this time of sorrow. The businessman was furious. He immediately called the florist to complain and said, what in the world happened? Do you have any idea how bad you made me look? And the florist replied, sir, I am so sorry. I was a little scrambled when you came in, but your situation wasn't nearly as bad as it was at the funeral home. That card said, best wishes in your new location. As you apply your time and resources, John Maxwell offers a suggestion for managing your personal focus. It's the 70-25-5 principle which means spending 70% of your personal time and resources on your strengths, 25% on improvements, and 5% on weaknesses. The 70%, that's to really drive hard in boosting your best abilities, maximize them. Using an analogy in the game of basketball, you wanna find your sweet spot and shoot and score, go back to that sweet spot and shoot and score every time. I heard a story about a basketball coach who watched his players during the many preseason practices the team held. He tried them in different scenarios and was able to identify each player's sweet spot. And his instruction to them was, do not shoot the ball unless you're in your sweet spot. 25% improvement to areas that can become strength. So you want to transform some high potential into new strength. You wanna develop it offline though, until it's ready to, as in the basketball game, to get in the game. It's okay to try to improve non-sweet spot, a non-sweet spot shot, but do it in between games. Perfect it and then demonstrate it before you take it in and go live. 5% on keeping weaknesses in check. We have to recognize those areas in which we're not gifted or even skilled. Avoid them where possible. In the basketball analogy, pass the ball. Let some other talented team member, member take that shot. Okay, now for poll number three, the 70-25-5 principle. Do you apply it? So you have about three choices there. Okay.
I love the response here. Dan, do you typically see very consistent results that come out of the polls? Yes, very, yeah. very consistent. Yeah. I was a little surprised on the 50-50 from the previous poll, though. Usually it's more swayed, you know, toward 70-30. Oh, okay. To the negative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, oh, this seems pretty consistent. Oh, there's a little bit that I'm kind of surprised at. But okay, I'm going to close it now. And let's share the results. 34% says, yes, I currently apply it. 63% no, I don't, but I see its value. Mm -hmm. And 3% said, no, I don't see a need for it. Yeah, that's very consistent to what, to what I've seen before. Yeah. Okay, good to go? Yep. Okay, number four, a weekend commitment. Great successes don't happen in one's first try. A failure can pose a negative impact on a person who might become demotivated if they're not expecting it. This can weaken or even halt their commitment. James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, spent 20 years laboring to perfect it. Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb in two or three or more tries, not even 50 or 100. He got it after one thousand tries who on this call today would continue after even 100 successful trials maybe not even 10 be honest thomas edison said many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up here's some examples of successful people you'll recognize their names every single one of their names who became famous and how they could easily have become discouraged and quit. Wolfgang Mozart, one of the geniuses of musical composition, was told by Emperor Ferdinand that his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, was far too noisy and contained far too many notes. Vincent van Gogh, whose paintings now set records for the sums they bring at auction, sold only one painting in his lifetime. Thomas Edison, one of the most prolific inventors in history, was considered unteachable as a child. Albert Einstein, perhaps one of the greatest thinkers of our time, was told by a Munich schoolmaster that he would never amount to much. Just like anyone else, great achievers are given multiple reasons to believe they are failures, but in spite of them, they persevere. Fear. It is the primary reason people slow down or stop in their quest for success. So the basic fear feeds the cycle and it begins at the top with the fear to the right now of rejection and failure. If that fear of rejection and failure, what it does is it leads to taking no action. If you take no action, you don't learn. You stifle your learning opportunities. <clears throat> Stifling your learning opportunities means you stay in the mode of inexperienced. If you stay inexperienced, you don't grow. If you don't grow, you perpetuate your inability, which then just continues on the fear cycle. To break the fear cycle, one must first recognize and accept that every human being, without exception, will spend much of their life making mistakes stepping beyond the fear of rejection and failure. Action brings both successes and mistakes, which bring experience. Experience brings competence. Competence brings confidence and confidence fuels more action. Theodore Roosevelt said, he who makes no mistakes makes no progress. And John Maxwell said, there are two types of people in this world, those who wanna get things done and those who don't wanna make mistakes. A number of years ago, Chuck Swindoll 
told the story of Chippy the parakeet. He said, the bird's problems began when the woman who owned him decided to clean up the seeds and the loose feathers from the bottom of his cage using a vacuum. When the phone rang, the owner turned away to pick it up and you guess it, with a thud and a whoosh, Chippy was gone. The owner quickly turned off the vacuum and unzipped the bag and there was Chippy. He was stunned but still breathing. Seeing that the little bird was covered with gray dust, his owner quickly rushed Chippy to the sink where she turned on the faucet full blast and held Chippy under the icy water. At that point, she realized that she'd done even more damage. And she quickly cranked up her blow dryer and gave the wet, shivering little parakeet a blast. Chuck finished up the story by saying, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. Like poor little Chippy, are there events from your past? that negatively influence your commitment to action and to moving forward with boldness into the future. Walter D. Wintle wrote a little classic poem, a little piece called The Man Who Thinks He Can. It goes like this. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but soon or late, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Now let's switch direction about our thinking about fear. There's another, another aspect of it. It's procrastination. We haven't mentioned that word here yet. Dennis Waitley said, Procrastination can be driven by the fear of success. What a thought. People may procrastinate because they're afraid of the success that they know will result if they move ahead. Because success can carry a heavy burden and it carries responsibility with it that's maybe beyond where we'd like to go, it's much easier to procrastinate and live on the, well, someday I'll philosophy. Number five, an unwillingness to change. A most prominent enemy of personal growth, achievement and success is inflexibility. In, in the most recent past decades, the speed of change has greatly accelerated and we all know that. And we all must adapt by adopting a willingness to change. A catalyst for growth is change. Change finds new ways of doing things better than before. It can get you out of a troubled situation. It can give you a new start. It can lead you onto a path of achievement and ultimately success. It can be stated in more than one way, but we've all heard somebody say, but that's the way we've always done it. Is that person you? Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the only constant in life is change. This proves that change is not just a modern day phenomenon. If you can't get yourself to love change, at least accept it because it is here to stay. It's a personal choice to change or to stay where you are. Number six, relying on talent alone. There are many successful people who lack talent in the area of their success. We can only wonder, how did they do that? How did they get there? They're not even talented. They don't even know what they're doing. And on the other side, there are many highly talented people who have not achieved success. Was it the fear cycle? Was it an unwillingness to change? Was it a lack of focus? Edward Pyron said, have success and there will always be fools to say that you have talent. Here's a little excerpt from Tom Rath's book, Strength Finder 2.0, in a chapter entitled, The Path of Most Resistance. Embracing the principle, you can be anything you wanna be, is something that plays out in the workplace every day. People are conditioned to wanna to strive for more, even when it may cause them personal trouble. A star salesperson believes she can be a great sales manager with some effort. She networks and interviews other managers to gain insight, 
reads every book on management she can find and stays late every night trying to get the job done at the expense of her family and even her health. Then an opportunity came and a few hard years into the job, she realizes that she doesn't have the natural talent to develop other people. Not only was that a waste of her time, but chances are she could have increased her contribution even more if she had stayed in that sales role, a role which she naturally excelled. Yet, organizational structures are built to drive people toward increases in income, status, and responsibility in ways that may go against a career progression that fits their talents. Many business leaders are obsessed with talent. Talent is considered to be the number one characteristic of recruits. Malcolm Gladwell points out that companies are targeting the hiring of MBAs from top universities. They promote them quickly and they reward them lavishly, but never really assess their performance. Personal story for me, I personally have learned that talent is not enough. I used to recruit people with a focus on their technical skills, and the other traits falling in line behind that. Several years ago, after seeing technically competent team members experience, experiencing professional drama, which I had to deal with, I realized that personal views, personalities, and demeanors needed to be right up in parallel with technical skills. In some cases, behavior needed to win over technical skills between candidates. Since my revelation, my teams have been much more cohesive and reflect winning teams any manager or leader wishes to wake up to every day. Here's some interesting facts. More than 50% of all CEOs of Fortune 500 companies had a C or C minus average in college. 65% of all US senators came from the bottom half of their school classes. 75% of US presidents were in the lower half club in school and more than 50% of millionaire entrepreneurs never finished college. Passion. Passion is fuel. It fills a person with energy. It's amazing what passion can do to boost a human to accomplish. It's the catalyst for focus and self-discipline. When a person is in the zone, they're fully focused, paying total attention, locked and loaded, and ready for any challenge that presents itself. It makes work fun. John Maxwell describes his transition from church pastor to creating his leadership company. He says he no longer works a day in his life. When your job is your passion, it no longer feels like work. It fulfills the life of the owner, overflowing into other areas. That energy that bubbles up from within a passionate person spills over onto other things around them. A passionate person with limited talent can outperform a passive or a person without passion, a passive person who has greater talent. Character is talent's vital partner. The absence of strong character cancels the effect of talent. No one will care much what you know if your character measures low on the scale. People cannot rise above the limitations of their character. Number seven, attitude, a negative attitude. James Allen said, a hardened or negative attitude is a dreaded disease that causes a closed mind and a dark future. When our attitude is positive and conducive to growth, the mind expands and progress begins. John Maxwell said, our attitude is the primary focus, force, I'm sorry, that will determine whether we succeed or failure. For some, attitude presents a difficulty in every opportunity. Have you ever heard this? Even when there's a great idea on the table, there's that one person in the room who's consistent in saying, well, the problem with that is, for others, it presents an opportunity in every difficulty, as opposed to Mr. Problem over there, it's great when somebody says, no worries, team, we will find a way through this. Because you'll be more likable and accepted for it, a positive attitude can make your work appear even better than it actually is. A negative attitude can paint a darker picture about you and your work. It may not be readily accepted and there may be criticisms about it, 
It's possible it might even be rejected in favor of, a nor of another more likable person's work, which might not be as good. Even with a bad attitude, a person can achieve success, but the level of effort required to succeed and maintain is greater than normal. We must watch our attitude toward others. Our attitude toward people often determines their attitude toward us. When we interact with another person in a pleasant way, the result has a much greater chance of being pleasant and productive overall. No guarantees though, it depends on the other person's attitude. On the other hand, if we bring a negative attitude to the discussion, it's most likely to result in a negative outcome, unless the other person is that super positive individual who has a high tolerance for bad behavior and lets our attitude just slide off. Here's a little story that illustrates a negative attitude triggered by a negative input. A mother and her adult daughter were out shopping one day, trying to make the most of a big sale weekend before Christmas. As they went from store to store in the mall, the older woman complained about everything. The crowds, the poor quality of merchandise, the prices, the sales clerks, and her sore feet. After the mother experienced a particularly difficult interaction with a clerk in one department store, she turned to her daughter and said, I'm never going back to that store again. Did you see the dirty look she gave me? And the daughter answered, Mom, she didn't give it to you. You had it on when you went in. Attitude is something you can change. A glass half full perspective allows us to see what we have and are glad, not what we've lost and are walking around with a dark cloud over our head. Make a decision to find something positive in everything. Set your mind on it. Whatever comes, stay positive. And your attitude needs your attention daily. Here's some closing thoughts. Rule number one in winning, don't beat yourself. This rule is self-explanatory. So far, we've heard enough to be aware of what can work in our favor and what can cause trouble in our dealings with others. Here's some food for thought. If a failure does come, ask yourself a few questions. What caused it? What did I learn? What next steps can I take? And what's my attitude toward it? Am I grateful or just angry? And will I stay motivated and passionate or will I fall into the fear cycle or some other negative flow like that? And who can help me with this issue? Start to branch out and think about what's your next step? Who can I go get knowledge and learnings from? Sir Winston Churchill said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. Coach John Wooden said, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. In addition to his quote about maintaining your enthusiasm, Sir Winston Churchill stated a quote about the value of continuous effort. Sir Winston Churchill, the legendary politician and statesman known for his leadership of the United Kingdom during the Second World War once said, Continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. We cannot rest on our victories, neither can we wallow in our defeats. If we all fail, and some of those failures will demoralize us. But even if a failure, but even in a failure, there are benefits to be gained and progress to be made. Some lessons can only be learned in failure, and a day is never lost if a lesson is learned. Failure is often a path to success if we persevere. Summary thoughts of mine. If you can change the way you see failure, getting a new perspective on its character, you'll gain the momentum to keep running the race. And in reality, failure, failure is nothing more than an investment in the process of achieving success. It's the price you must pay for progress. Okay, finally, our last poll, what effect has this talk had on your perception of failure? Okay, so let's launch this. It made little to no impact. I already saw value of failure or it changed my perception of failure as an investment now.
Wow, this is impressive. I love the first few seconds when I throw a comment and Stan, you have to guess what the result is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I am going to close it. I'll leave it for five seconds if anybody is still deciding. There you go. Okay, closing it off now. Okay. And the results are 19% think it made little to no impact. I already saw value of failure and 81% said it changed my perception of failure. Awesome. Great, that's awesome. That was the objective here. Thank you. All right, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who attended for, to, for attending this session. And as you said today, yeah. my hope so is that you we okay. we have uh, we have questions then for you. Yeah, I know. I just want to make a little okay. sta a statement here. So as okay. you sign up today, my hope is that you'll take away at least one thing that has made an impact on you that you'll embrace and put into practice, allowing it to make a positive difference in your life. So thank you very much for that. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. So there's a few questions that have already populated and I encourage everybody else to just type up anything that you have in the chat box, please. So a question from Orlando is in some traditional organizations where we still have linear mindset, empire the fear to failure, how to combat this immune system to create an abundance mindset? Yeah, that, that's a great question because that the abundance mindset is not probably the common mindset. There are so many challenges and difficulties and problems and obstacles that we encounter every day. You know, from the time we rise up in the morning, we go out into the workplace or we go into whatever we do all day and we come back home and there's some challenges and, you know, there's good things and then there's the negative things. And many times we find ourselves letting those negative things be right on the forefront of our mind. So in order to, I, I believe that in order to create the abundance mindset, you have to start a person at a time, a topic at a time, and just bring a positive spin as, as much of the time as you possibly can to, to situations around you. One of, the, one of the real keys that I have found, and this is my personal experience, is as you start to see good things in people and you tell them, you recognize them for it, it can just be a very kind word, it can be a, a recognition that's published, you know, in the workplace, you know, whatever it happens to be, you'll start to change people's perception of what is, what they should really be focusing on. They like that positivity. And so they'll remember that. You know, there's probably, there's a quote that I remember, people won't remember what you did or, or no, what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And as you start to be infectious about your positivity, and you don't have to go stand up on a, on a platform somewhere and, and preach to the crowds at the mall or in the courtyard or where, no, that, that's not really what it is. It's one person at a time. Very true. A uh, question from, sorry, my screen moved. Okay, from Denholm. Passion seems to invoke suffering. Remember the passion of Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, so uh, is yeah, that a question? Comment is that, yeah, his comment is that passion seems to invoke suffering. What do you think oh, okay. about it? Well, okay, the, the passion I'm talking about is that which we, we all have been given a gifting. And there are many people throughout their entire lifetime who never really either recognize that gifting or they feel they can't take action on that gifting. So they never apply that thing that's in the core of themselves. So the passion is that thing that you just want to do. Now, uh, in, in the passion of of Christ, he had a passion to save the world, to save the, 
to eliminate and eradicate the sins of the people. And so that was his passion. So it, it could be somebody's passion to go and die. It, it really can, if, that, if there's a bigger reason behind that. I hope that answered that question. Yeah. And what do you think about, uh, can, can uh, purpose be a better word? That's just a comment from uh, Dan Holm again. Yeah, I'm sorry, what was the word? Purpose. So he's saying purpose? instead of passion, can we go with the purpose? Yeah, so you, you can. And th those are very in parallel with each other. So if you have a purpose, the passion is the thing that drives you to go accomplish it. It's the, it's the fuel. Oh, wow. There is a comment from Lisa that this is an awesome presentation. We're in the process of preparing for a major MRP change. And my VP shared that I will be involved in the change. So seems like this is a perfect timing for Lisa to hear this all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing with us. Yeah, and you, a comment from uh, John is please explain fear of success. Yeah, fear of success. Okay. For example, I, I have a person who is on my team and I wanted to assign her. Uh, she's brilliant. She's got a finance uh, degree and a master's in mechanical engineering and her, her mind is analytical and it, awesome. So I wanted to assign her a project that had a lot of visibility to the VP levels and to business leaders within my company. Uh, and she was so she has she's prone to um you know get a little bit anxious uh and she just said no 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 i, I can't i don't want to do that she could have had an amazing success if she had wanted to and been driven to apply herself but there's a fear there because uh it, she just didn't want to be in that light she wanted to stay in her little place and accomplish at her lids level you know everybody has a lid you know, and they, if you, if they, uh, we have to aspire to either uh, increase that lid by increasing our skills and our abilities and moving and progressing, or we leave that lid the same. We just do the same thing we do every day and we're satisfied with that. So the fear of success is uh, really related to not wanting to expand your borders in some way, shape, or form. You might even be thinking that. If I become the subject matter expert of this particular subject, everybody's gonna be wanting me to do this or that, and I don't want that. So that's the fear of success. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, a question from Gilberto. Hi, Gilberto. Do you think it is important to understand the person's mindset previous to proceed with any recommendation? Yeah, it, it is important to try to understand a person's mindset. Uh, absolutely. And that, that is a, a complex task, you know, for a leader or for e anybody, even if it's a, it's a peer of yours, but especially for a leader who has a team of people that, or a group of people, even if they don't report to them, you know, a manager is somebody who has somebody reporting to them. A leader is somebody who has leadership skills and imply, you know, it's just a, imposes that on people by influencing them. But a, a leader, in order to influence somebody, does have to pay attention to who is it that I'm attempting to lead? Who is it that I'm attempting to influence? How do they think? And I gave an analogy earlier in a meeting today about uh, challenges of a leader that you may have a team of 10 people and you have something new that you've pitched the vision to them on and everybody's on board. And you got one person who thinks you're trying to harm them by, by having them take on a project that's going to make an explosive difference. And, they, and there's this one outlier. Well, that leader needs to understand, well, what is it about that person that gives them that impression? And it could lead all the way back to something in childhood. And, you know, we, we just don't know. But there's some psychology and some just greater understanding of that person's psyche and what makes them make the decisions and have the perceptions that they have. 
I hope that answered that. You're, I think you're adding a lot of value. I have so many things I can talk about and I'm holding my comments that I shouldn't talk because there's awesome questions and I want to utilize the time properly. Uh, okay. There's another question from uh, Mariana. It says, um, how to stay positive when management do not correct employees um, that do not play with the team? Oh, gosh. That that's a hard one. That you know, there's a there's a book from way in the past, and I don't. I, I think I read it, you know, back, way back somewhere about how to manage your boss. <laughs> so there there are some things, you know, maybe it's probably a good idea to get that book or whatever the updated version of it is. But there are some things that you can do that that help you influence those who are above you. You can, and if you do it in the right way without shaming them or making them feel defensive because you are the lower person and they're the boss, and that's why that's, that's my answer. You know, you don't want to rub them the wrong way, but there's things that you can do. If you have a, a boss that is uh, able to be humble, to understand that they don't know everything. And guess what? Uh, some manager or a boss who thinks that they know it all, the, the people know that they don't. I mean, it's obvious to the people. It may not be obvious to the boss, but uh, you just have to be that positive person. And just like I talked about a little bit earlier about taking things one person at a time, that's yeah. just another one of those people. Yeah, and definitely if you, if you enjoy working where you are and uh, it has to be a positive way of working and positive environment around you. So sometimes, um, you know, sharing information that can enlighten them works and in some cases you just have to make them look good and make yourself look good right end of yeah. the day people want to have an answer that what is in it for me anytime yeah. you're asking them to change yeah yeah you know i'm looking at a little question an audience question in the chat there that i haven't been looking through there but i see when it says are you going to set out a pdf or of this powerpoint out after yeah, the I've talk answered. yeah i've answered yeah. them this, everything will be uploaded on social media and yeah, you and will just, see it in my sq community site yeah, and i just wanted to make a comment about that through throughout the presentation uh, i had these little oops these little notes at the bottom to see an example those are the little stories that i was reading I didn't want to put those up on the screen because you guys would start reading. You wouldn't even hear what I'm saying. So they're all there. Every little uh -huh. breakout story that I uh, read through, you know, quotes from people or stories about Chippy the parakeet, they're all contained in the deck down below. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Another question we have is um, in, in the business, time makes a difference. When do you say it is enough and out of and and cut your loss ah that's a that's a great question uh sometimes the the quote time is money comes into play and if you're in charge okay if it's your business you make the call if it's not your business and i work for a company that is not my business and at some point in time you do have to just stop because you have to move on you can't you can't make it as uh, your manager would probably say, you can't make this your lifetime project, you know, you know, you, you don't want to get to that point. So you, you just have to do the best you can with the time and the resources that you have. Now, the other thing is, if you get to a certain point and you know that you're making significant progress, and even though you don't know how many more trials you need to, to make to make this thing really push through to a success, uh, if you're if you're credible with the people that you're giving your statuses to, they may let you have more time because if they see that you're documenting progress and they see it. Now, if you just come back to them and you don't give them any kind of data, any kind of evidence, you just say, hey, we're doing great. We just need a little more time. And you're not showing them anything. They might just say, no, 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 no. But if you show them something, chances are the reasonable people will say, ah, great progress. Okay, just keep going. We, we have, uh, thank you, Stan. We have come a very close. We are actually reached four o'clock, but I have one question. I didn't want to disappoint Miguel. What kind of activities can I develop to promote thinking outside the box with my team? I would say the references that I've given, uh, especially the book Failing Forward, 
and some of the, just get the audio book, Failing Forward by John Maxwell and listen to it when you're driving back and forth from work or whatever, whatever you want to do or get the book. You, you, there's a lot more examples. I gave the seven key reasons people fail. I think there's 13 or 15 of them. So there's a bunch more examples. And I think just reading through and getting that flow will get you in your mindset thinking about how you can make that work for you. Thank, thank you, Stan, and thank you everyone for raising the questions and taking an hour of your time to join us today. Today's presentation and recording will be posted on our My ASQ community as well as on the YouTube channel sometime this week. Our next webinar will be held on October the 6th at 3 o'clock, and the topic is Leader Credibility. Why do some get their ideas adopted while others not so much by Dr. Joe Farrow? Registrations can be done on my ASQ community and to get an automate, automatic notification on future webinars, you can follow us on our LinkedIn page. We would highly appreciate that you fill a one minute survey, which it will pop up on your screen as soon as you close this webinar. And for those who are attending over the phone call, you will receive a follow up email within an hour. For those of you who attended at least 40 minutes, you will receive a separate email within this week, which you can use it or to claim your credits. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone for your time and Stan amazing nuggets that you have shared with us. Amazing. Thank you Thank very you. much. We look forward to having you again in our another webinar. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.